updates and be part of our conversation squad. Um, title Citizen versus Labharti interrogating the welfare state. So I'm going to talk very much about the welfare state, but really from the point of view um, of these big questions around welfare citizenship. I have long been uh, a student, an observer, and also an occasional participant uh, in the halting, stumbling effort of, making, of the making of India's welfare state since the early 2000s. But as I started thinking about what I wanted to speak on today, at one level it seemed obvious. I wanted to talk very much about uh, a matter that is very close to my heart and that I have been uh, a close student of. But I also came to this title and um, the, the bulk of my presentation today with a fair amount of trepidation. Trepidation because the socio-economic and political churning that India is going through today is so significant that I think it has thrown much of what we know, both about the Indian state, its public institutions, as well as the nature of state society dynamics that underlie much of the study of the Indian welfare state, or rather the welfare state more generally, into contention. But also, so many of the tools that we deploy as scholars, as observers, as participants um, in social and economic life um, are currently just not available. We live in a time today where data, research, just the act of engaging in critical reflection, reflection that often challenges mainstream political positions, can quite easily be clubbed as anti-national. I know after this you will be hearing more about the challenges of academic freedom, but one of the consequences of shrinking academic freedom is that we simply don't have the tools and methods that we know to use to be able to arrive at objective analysis of social processes that confront us in our realities. So it's hard really to speak about something, even if it is something that you know well and that you have observed and participated in, with any real objectivity as such, or rather not so much objectivity, but uh, with, with, with any real uh, certainty. And so what I want to offer today are just some reflections, thesis, ideas that have come to me as I've observed the transformation that we are undergoing um, in the making and shaping of India's welfare state. I seek here not so much to speak of the particular narrow kind of welfare tools that we are adopting specifically, um, or necessarily even of questions of impact, we don't have the data, but very much about um, the nature of the state as it's uh, evolving, the underlying political economy. And I do know, I'm also a passionate believer uh, in India's federal dynamic and have argued for deepening India's federalism, so I'm well aware that there is deep variation across states in India. One cannot spe speak of one welfare state, but many different experiments of welfare states that are unfolding in different parts of India. I will, however, try and step back from that variation to try and speak to some broad trends as I see them emerge, because I think it is important for us to reflect on what type of welfare state we are coalescing towards. This reflection is important not just from the point of view of the questions of how we are addressing the very critical issue of poverty alleviation um, and of uh, building human capital, but also from the point of view of how we are advancing the critical constitutional guarantees of equality, justice, and freedom, and above all, our democratic project. Before I present the details of my argument, I did want to also highlight to what I think are critical background conditions that have shaped where we are today. One, of course, is the nature of the Indian economy. Far away from the bluster of the third largest economy, the fastest growing economy, there is a hard truth about the structural reality of the nature of India's economy. First and foremost, the fact undeniably is that our economic growth trajectory has brought us to a place where growth has not necessarily led to the creation of quality jobs across the country. 
There is a very important recently released study that has come out by the Azim Premji University, by scholars at the Azim Premji University that I would urge all that are interested in this question to look at very closely. It painstakingly and with a great degree of rigor and detail reminds us that there is no relationship, and if anything, a weak negative relationship between GDP growth and employment growth in India. This is not unsurprising if you look at the nature of economic growth in India. Our structural transformation, which post-1991 most certainly played an important role in moving millions out of extreme poverty, but essentially it was unique in that while it moved people out of agriculture, it sort of skipped low-end, low-skilled manufacturing towards high-skilled manufacturing and services. So the bulk of jobs that were created, as Amit Basole of Azim Premji University has very effectively dis demonstrated, have come, as we moved out of agriculture, the bulk of jobs have essentially made, them, made their way into the extremely precarious world of construction and informal work. Much of India remains, even if it is out of extreme poverty, in what the World Bank describes as the vulnerable population. Approximately 40% of India's population, of course, dated from data of 2011. Uh, it is one income shock away from poverty. Most of India lives in extremely precarious conditions, and most of India does not have access to quality jobs. At the same time, there is also significant inequality much debate has been hand, had in India about income inequality, but there is also deep spatial inequality. We saw this in the most extreme and the most indignified form in the movement of our millions of workers in the peak of the COVID lockdown in March 2022, as they were left vulnerable and precarious, stripped of their rights and dignities, being forced to quite literally walk home without any support of people or the state. But there is also deep intrastate variation. Even our richer states, such as these, where we, uh, uh, Telangana, where we are here today, has a large number of districts that find themselves in extreme poverty. In a sense, we are in a unique place where there is no clear answer to these structural challenges. And as a consequence, the political pressures that are generated out of this, the great advantage of democracy, that it genuinely creates political demand from below. And because we don't have good answers to this big challenge of India's economic transition, in fact, I would argue that we almost have a political consensus around the nature of growth that we have to generate. India needs to grow. We, the, and, and grow, grow in, the, in the path that we adopted in 1991. But the failures of that path of 1991 do not find its way into the political discourse. Instead, those failures are responded through by virtue of political demand from below by what the economist Stratin Roy has called the compensatory state. It is a welfare state that is evolving that is seeking to compensate for the inability of the Indian state to respond to the structural challenge that the economy and its particular pathway presents. And therefore, it creates the political opportunity in a rather tantalizing way to respond to this challenge by offering all kinds of um, uh, uh, welfare pro forms of welfare, particularly in the form of cash, but one that doesn't always adequately seek to address the really core questions of human development that perhaps brought us into this challenging structural transformation moment in the first place. Questions of health, education, nutrition. It is telling if you look at budgets across government of India as well as states, you will find increasingly far less, almost stagnant investment in core areas of health, yes, despite COVID. Don't believe the blare of narrative that you hear constantly. Uh, but also in areas of education and other crucial elements of forming human capital. But you do see a very interesting rise in the kind of expenditure commitments that are being made towards this quote-unquote compensation, cash transfers of all forms that are being provided to citizens um, who have been kept out of the workforce. 
But there are also two other important consequences of this. In some senses, as a consequence of a compensatory welfare, the nature of the political negotiation around welfare is very different from the trajectory of welfare state regimes that we saw both in the social democratic model of Western Europe, uh, but also in what, uh, uh, what, what scholars have called the productivist regimes of Southeast Asia. These are not welfare regimes that have emerged necessarily out of a consensus that has emerged from bargains between labor and capital, or in any way a welfare state that is about influencing or engaging with market structures, questions of wages and employment. These are very much about a welfare state that is emerging in response to an economy that simply is unable to employ. This also means that where you have the bulk of your employment in the form of informal, uh, 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 in, uh, in the informal economy, the strength and capacity of labor's bargaining power remains extremely weak. And so it is telling that especially in the last few years, across states and at the government of India level, labor regulation, labor laws have in many ways been weakened and there hasn't been any serious significant mobilization around that question. So the discourse on welfare in India is not necessarily emerging as a discourse around strengthening uh, or mediating rather relationships between labor and capital. It is very much emerging as a discourse that is about compensating for an economic pathway that has simply been unable to do the job of what an economic growth pathway ought to do, which is to provide quality employment, um, full employment, and protect uh, 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 and provide safety nets that pr protect um, uh, 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 the vulnerable. With, of course, the important exception of the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, the, 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 Nereg, the Narega, which was, formed as, which was framed as a right to work that aims to address some of these elements of shaping employment and strengthening labor bargaining power. Most of our political deb debates on welfare today avoid questions of redistribution and avoid questions of, uh, of employment almost entirely. In a sense, then, the compensatory logic of welfare is what is winning the game. The second element that has shaped our debates on welfare is the question of governance. We are, I would argue, not unfairly so, a disenchanted citizenry. That's where the original title of this talk came from, the disenchanted state. We are deeply disenchanted with the ability of the state to actually deliver on its core promises perhaps because we have routinely seen the state prove itself to be completely incompetent at doing some of the basic things that the modern nation state is expected to do, delivering public services. But, it, but we've allowed this sense of disenchantment to get the better of us. At one level, this sense of disenchantment has legitimized a parsimonious political approach to welfare. It is easy now to dismiss questions of welfare as nothing but freebies, or in today's political discourse, raveries that are offered by hungry politicians in their desire to purchase votes from vulnerable citizens. It is so easy that discourses like this make headlines in our country and stop us from asking the real question, why is it that we have such deep inequality and poverty in this country? Why is it that we are not able to afford basic human dignities for all citizens? Why have we come so far away from our constitutional project? It is also a discourse that has allowed us to legitimately dismiss any serious debate on taxation. Some years ago, I wrote a paper with uh, the economist Lan Pritchett. The title was not mine, his, but it really reflects the sentiment most effectively. The title was, Taxes, Are They a Price of Civilization or a Tribute to the Leviathan? Essentially arguing that when the state completely fails in its ability to provide basics, to do its basic, uh, to, 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 uh, to undertake its basic functions, it legitimizes the view that taxes are essentially not a force for good, but an extraction by a coercive power to feed itself with little benefit to the larger public. And so every time serious questions of redistribution make their way into the public discourse in India and the political discourse, 
they are very quickly silenced by vested interests, including big capital, in the guise of governance fails. This is nothing but raveries and freebies. And at best, take a helicopter and drop some money down. It's equivalent to that. It will go into the wrong hands for the wrong purpose. We have thus failed to engage in a, in a serious political dialogue and build a social consensus on critical issues of welfare that welfare states ought to deal with, questions of quality of life, of dignity, of full citizenship. Our welfare state and our welfare imagination has got caught in these dilemmas of an economic trajectory that has failed to do what it's supposed to do, but minus a political or social discourse that can find ways out of this trap, thinking of welfare very much as a limited form of compensation on the one hand, and our disenchantment with the state and its ability to do even the basics that allows us to say, we would rather markets do their job with very limited mediation from the state, and any conversation on serious redistribution, any conversation on matters of full citizenship, best left aside for another day. There was, however, a brief moment in our history, the brief moment where I found myself learning about the Indian welfare state, where we did see a significant shift. If you go back, actually, into the history of the evolution of India's welfare state, you will see that there has always been this critical tension, the tension between how to articulate welfare as rights and advance our social rights in that sense, and the role of politics in shaping this agenda. This is the tension that resulted in socioeconomic welfare not being accorded full status as rights in our constitution, but finding place as directive principles in the hope that democracy would mediate these. Our civil and political rights in the early years were far better articulated than our social rights, which were relegated in some sense, therefore, to the realm of charity, or more importantly, to what democracy could do and what democracy was willing to do was at best charity and a little bit of patronage. Politics evolved to create a welfare state that was no less and no more than the Maibab Sarkar for most Indians. And of course, we did not have the resources to really robustly invest in welfare. And so that became the excuse. The post-reform era, post-1991, saw a different moment. Money could no longer be the excuse and democracy as it matured created its own pressures. The coming together of social movements, judiciary and politics created this extremely crucial moment where we, en we, where we ended up making up a plethora of rights, the right to work, the right to food, the right to education, which came together to build for this brief moment uh, an, an important and unique effort of a rights-based welfare. What was particularly crucial about this moment was that in addition to the legislation, each of these rights built into themselves a set of procedural requirements, the right to information, social audits, participatory planning. Each of these moved us along in a due direction, away from this idea of the Maibab Sarkar of patronage towards a new imagination that recognized citizens as rights claiming, claiming individuals that could, through the force of these procedural requirements of right to information, social audits, and participatory planning, empower themselves to engage, to participate, to confront the state. Early in my professional life, I had the good fortune uh, of learning about the nature of what, uh, how this kind of citizenship can actually translate into a tactile form of, uh, of claim making. Uh, thanks in no small measure to friends here in Hyderabad, Karuna Akela, who's here in the audience, Soumya Kedambi, who were great, graceful enough to allow me to tag along with them as they set about this ambitious project of setting up a social audit society here in, in Andhra Pradesh, in what was at the time Andhra Pradesh. And I could see firsthand the extent to which the actual articulation of a right and the creation of these procedural requirements of social audits became training grounds for active citizenship. It raised awareness, this process, 
instilled a sense of civic responsibility, and created legitimate spaces for participation with the state. This is perhaps the first and rare moment where the welfare state sought to engage with these ideas of building a, an active citizenry, of responding to the imagination of equality, justice that was articulated in our, in our constitution, of ensuring that through this active training of citizenship, rights could be claimed and a robust welfare state could be delivered. The underlying normative principle was, of course, to advance our social rights to this aspiration of a fuller citizenship, but it is worth also remembering that the project of rights is embedded in its own tensions and is deeply complex. It raises important challenges around questions of enforceability, of affordability, of universality, and above all, of state capacity. That governance question, that sense of disenchantment doesn't come out of a lack of real experience. It comes from the very fact that we have substantively failed to invest deeply in the Indian state, by and large, with a few exceptions. And therefore, implementing any project of this imagination often finds itself in direct confrontation with the failure of the capacity of the state to respond in ways that it needs to. I remember once as a participant in one of these social audits, deep into the middle of the night, preparing the paperwork for the social auditors to carry with them as they went from village to village the next day, asking questions and mapping whether what the state says it has done in the name of workers has in fact actually been recorded uh, and, 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 and measures the lived experience of the workers. And asking myself, should it really take so long? Should we have to work so hard for the average ordinary citizen to receive nothing but a petty wage of 100 rupees. There is something really rotten and deeply rotten with our state. Yet, the project itself was a project that sought to break that through empowerment of the citizenry, giving them the space to precisely ask this question and use the tools of democracy to challenge it. But our disenchantment, I think, got the better of us even as these pro the project of rights haltingly found its way through the labyrinth of the Indian state and found pockets of experimentation in different parts of India, we were looking elsewhere. The innovation that technology brought with it allowed us to imagine a different state. And that is the, the underlying feature of the welfare state as we see it today in this contemporary moment. I'll come to that in a, in a second. But I did want for us to reflect briefly on this question of technology. I am not a Luddite. I'm sitting here with my iPad. I have my phone. I use every kind of uh, technology innovation that is available to me. But in using these technology innovations that we have so easily adopted into every aspect of our state, you can't walk into a government department now without discussing the golden data dashboard. You can't walk into a government department without looking at the marvels of the management information system that they have built out. You can't walk into a government department or for that matter as a citizen. You cannot engage with the state without your phone, the OTP, your Aadhaar number, and every form of technological innovation that has been built in. The direct benefit transfers has been pro projected across, to the, across the world as one of India's greatest innovations to social welfare uh, and, and to governance more generally. All of this in the guise of making the state more efficient and more effective. And I have to ask whether in this game of seeking efficiency, each of these perhaps does lead us to greater efficiency. Once we have data, we'll be able to answer this question with, with, with actual evidence. But on first principles, perhaps there is a movement towards greater efficiency. But have we ever stopped to ask whether greater efficiency also leads to trade-offs of accountability and democracy? Have we ever stopped to ask that the extent to which an MIS system defines you as a citizen now means that you have very few spaces to actually challenge what the government does? Technology, by definition, is centralizing. It takes you as a citizen and puts you into a centralized database. You can be excluded, 
Verif you can be sorry, you can be authenticated, verified, and then excluded from that database on the back of an algorithm. What happens to the tactile process of claim making? Where does that process unfold? And are we even asking for it? Or have we sought the efficiency of technology precisely in the hope to avoid that messy negotiation, the messiness, the long game of claim making, the long game of democracy that requires negotiation and often compromises? Have we decided to give up on that entirely? It's a question worth asking because it feeds very much into the welfare state that is evolving in today's times. The rights experiment from 2004 to 2014 with all its flaws uh, brought us into a new political era, certainly at the national level. And in that new political moment, we've also seen a very remarkable shift in how the welfare state itself has evolved. It is interesting to, to remind ourselves that perhaps on account of the nature of the Indian economy, there is no question of any political party arriving on the national or for that matter the regional stage in India and not addressing the very fundamental questions of welfare. It is how it addresses it that shapes the nature of our democracy. And I want to spend a little bit of time reflecting on the how as this has evolved, because there certainly was a time in 2014-15 when the discourse went that, in fact, the Indian, the, 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 in, in the sort of maximum, government, uh, government, mi maximum governance, minimum government framework, that we would see far less welfare and far more market. That hasn't quite come to pass, but it has created a new moment of welfare a new moment of welfare with, I will argue, a very distinct idea of citizenship embedded in it, one that takes us away from that moment of rights-claiming citizens, perhaps closer back to the Mai Bap Sarkar of yore. From its early days onwards, the BJP has sought carefully to create a very distinct identity of, of welfare, one that approaches the idea of, of, of welfare by positioning it as empowerment in opposition to the entitlements or rights or doles of the past. But it's worth asking, what exactly is this definition of empowerment? We hear this phrase repeatedly and often, and we find versions of definitions of this in different speeches uh, and arguments presented by senior members of the government. The poor need to be empowered to fight poverty on their strength and free themselves of poverty, said the Prime Minister back in 2015. In 2022, he went on to argue in, in an independence speech, in, in, in an Independence Day speech, that it is the job of government to give electricity, but it is the duty of citizens to save every unit. In another speech given by a Home Minister back in 2022, he argued that we have provided gas connections, power connections to citizens, and it is up to them to pay their bills. We have made toilets. It is up to them to maintain them. What we have done was to upgrade their lives. This is empowerment. Empowerment in this framing, I would argue, shapes the role of the state and its welfare responsibilities not so much as a moral obligation of the state towards its citizens, but really rather an act of giving, a transactional act of giving, which involves the state giving and the citizens responding to what is being given with a sense of duty. In some senses then, shifting accountability for welfare away from the state towards the citizen. And leaving, I would argue, the citizen somewhat in the shape of a passive recipient rather than an active rights-claiming citizen. It also uses a very interesting phrase to define who gets welfare. And it's worth reflecting a little bit on it. This phrase is drawn, is deployed largely in uh, the Hindi belt, the word labharti, which roughly translates as recipient or beneficiary. It has very much entered the political lexicon. When we talk about welfare today, we very often synonymously say the labharti work, the category of recipient, the, uh, the labharti. What does the idea of labharti mean? If you draw on the idea of labharti as the beneficiary and place it within this reimagination 
of the, uh, of the definition of empowerment. It essentially refers to somebody that is the recipient of these gas connections, these power connections, uh, the toilets, the cash, and all that is handed over to the citizen by the state. It is a new type of citizen, a beneficiary, a beneficiary that is stripped in some senses of any other ascriptive identity. You could argue that perhaps this is taking us closer towards a broader civic sense of national identity, but it also allows you, more importantly, to create an imagination of our empowerment that is stripped of identity assertion and a grammar of rights, and very much about being a recipient of whatever it is that the state wishes to provide you. It also allows you to frame the idea that there is no such thing as discrimination by virtue of an identity. If you are a quote unquote labharti, you are a beneficiary of welfare. All your other identities subsumed under that. It raises very important questions for who and how we mobilize, and how do we understand the fundamental discriminatory nature of the relationship between states and citizens, that form of discrimination which is very much shaped by, our, by other ascriptive identities of religion, of caste, of ethnicity. It essentially says, as long as you are a quote unquote labharti defined by me, you are very much part of the Sabka Vikas, Sabka uh, Saat, Sabka Vikas framework. And this is not unique just to uh, the national government, just to the BJP. In state after state after state, if you see the nature of welfare benefits that are being deployed on a routine basis, you will find largely that these tend to be what the economist Arvind Subramaniam has referred to as uh, 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 public goods provisioning of private goods, this delivery of cash, delivery of in-kind benefits, and delivered in the form of identifying beneficiaries, beneficiaries along the basis of sets of eligibility criteria, all entered into a database uh, through, uh, and th through the trick of, of the computer, the click of a button, the cash and kind benefits reaching different, ind different individual accounts. In all of this process, mobilization is undertaken on the back of the beneficiary, and the grammar that is adopted of who is a beneficiary is a grammar of those who are eligible, those who can be authenticated, those who can be identified into the, into the database. Essentially, we no longer talk about citizens, we talk about beneficiaries or labharthis, names and numbers on a database. It also allows you very effectively to be able to build then a very direct relationship between the politician and the beneficiary itself. And this is at the heart of how political legitimacy is increasingly being built, not through the messy negotiations of mobilization around different claims and interests that are being placed on the state, but through passive mobilization of the labharti linked to what the politician itself can give. My colleague Nilanjan Sarkar has, has coined an important framework of how to think about this question. He argues that increasingly what we see today is a politics of vishwas, a politics which seeks to build the moral legitimacy of the leader by establishing an emotive connect a deep loyalty between the leader and citizens. And there is no better way to establish that emotive connect, that deep loyalty, than by ensuring that the leader can directly deliver private goods through public means to individual citizens, to individual labharthis rather. This is not unique, again, to how the national politics is being run. You see this in state after state after state consistently and routinely. You see it in how, uh, the power of it in how voter data is being, uh, in, in, in what we can learn from voter data, which tells us that increasingly, individual beneficiaries of programs are able to establish a direct attribution 
for the being recipients of these welfare benefits directly to the individual party leaders from where this comes. This has both done importantly, uh, this has both played an important role in centralizing politics. It has cut down, cut out the political intermediaries that politicians relied on, uh, leadership of political parties relied on. But it has also allowed, uh, allowed leaders to establish this very direct, almost transactional, loyalty-based relationship with the Labharti. So it is about extracting loyalty out of uh, the voter rather than pro performing the moral duty of an elected leader towards its citizens through the provision of welfare benefits. Tangible visit, visible benefits make it easy to mobilize worker, workers, stripping us of any discourse on matters of citizenship and rights. All of this together is legitimized in the guise of efficiency. We are able to bypass so much of what is messy and complex of, of the state. We are able to bypass those indisciplined workers of the Indian state who don't show up to schools, who don't show up to the health centers, who are corrupt, who look for any opportunity to make petty, uh, to, to make a petty, uh, uh, to pocket, the, uh, to take petty, petty bribes to, 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 to pocket for themselves. We are able to get rid of all those mediators that ensure that elite interests dominate over the interests of the most marginalized by delivering directly into individual accounts, by identifying the Labharti work that is the beneficiary of India's welfare project. This is, I am told routinely and very often in drawing rooms of Delhi, the power of governance. Look how efficient our governance has become. This is what citizens are responding to it leaves me deeply, deeply uncomfortable. Uncomfortable because in our sense of disenchantment with what the state can and cannot do, we have also acquired a deep impatience with the hard work of actually building a state. No state can be built without active citizenship, without citizens actively claiming their rights from the state, and also, of course, performing their duty. But a state that relies entirely on duty of labharthis rather than on fulfilling its moral obligation of, uh, of rights, of delivering on rights to citizens and advancing their rights, is no state and no democracy. We have, in the guise of efficiency, given up on the aspiration of advancing our, our democracy and advancing our constitutional guarantees. We've allowed us to ins ourselves, in some sense, to only seek and only ask efficiency of our government. The reason why I feel uncomfortable when I'm repeatedly told that governance has improved is because I often ask, is this all that we are asking of our state? That our state is able to create a payment pipeline that through a technological innovation, marvelous as it might well be, is able to transfer a few hundred thousand rupees into individual bank accounts? Is this all that we expected of our democracy? Whatever happened to the project of a truly just and equal society? In the guise of governance, why have we stopped talking about well-being and redistribution? Why have we stopped talking about citizenship and that long project of deepening it? It will not happen in 75 years. It requires hard work. As we celebrate Gandhiji's 154th birth anniversary today, we must ask ourselves these questions because I believe strongly that Gandhi would have asked much more of us. We have to for the sake of the father of this great nation, ask these quest uncomfortable questions to ourselves. Let us not limit ourselves and our welfare state project to a project of creating more labharthis that can be authenticated and excluded, and instead remind ourselves that the true project of nation building and state building was to work harder towards a fuller aspiration of full citizenship we, as rights-bearing citizens, must demand this. Thank you. Thank you, Yamini. We'd like to open your session for Q&A. Um, yes, many hands up. Would you like to take all the questions together or one by yeah, one? I think we can take one. Uh, yeah, together would be good. Together will do. Yes, I see one hand in the right. 
yes. When are our volunteers here? Gray shirt, third row from behind. Please stand up. Yes. Here. Short questions, please. Excuse me. No, no. Behind. Great. Hello. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. For the talk, uh, it was truly very insightful. Uh, what I wanted to ask was, how do we kind of shift this attitude from a very compensatory state? and where the society actually demands higher standards from the government. And another important thing that I wanted you to talk about is how the delimitation will affect the federalism in our country. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the gentleman here, can you please stand up, sir? He'll be able to see you. Nice lecture, Ramini ji. Simple question. The list of Labharti made out of citizen, does it change along with the change in the leadership of political hierarchy? Does this changes with the political hierarchy or parties? Thank you. Front row here, please. And we'll come to you on that side. We haven't taken a question. Yes, you. Next. Good morning to everyone. You have used the word of Labhaiti. I am using the word of Lufana. This word is going on more. Can you combine both these words? Labhaiti and Lufana and say something on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did you get that question? Who is going on? Who is going on? Did you get that question? Who is going on? Who is going on? Who is going on? Uh, and one final question there, the gentleman that, please stand up. Sir, this is not I'm a sorry, question. we'll have to take questions later. This is I'm not sorry. a question, Just basically this you. is seeking uh, information. Uh, can you speak up please, we can't hear you. Uh, this is not a question, basically this is seeking information, uh, because we have global exposure. Uh, the thing is, uh, India stands uh, at uh, GDP of 3.5 trillion dollars as of today. And uh, according to purchasing power party, we have capacity of up to go up to 11 trillion dollars, right? So a demand is there in the market and ease of doing business is also very good in the country nowadays. Ease of doing business. Despite that, uh, why organizations are not increasing the investments? Because that is the only way we can increase the economy. Because to hit the 5 trillion dollar economy, unless we increase investments, uh, we cannot hit the 5 trillion dollar uh, a target uh, sir thing. since yours is not a question we've got your uh, statement we'll take one question the gentleman standing there at the back blue shirt final question good afternoon everybody madam i just want to know conceptually when we teach in the classroom what exactly where exactly you locate welfare state in India, exactly what is the regime you find that it is a right-based welfare state and how do you differentiate that welfare state from post-1990s kind of freebies and all. So I think it will be great help if students, some of the young mind students who are here will be able to actually demarcate this is welfare right-based and this is what is freebies or populist welfare measures. We got your question. Yeah. Please go ahead. Thank you for those wonderful questions. Maybe I'll start uh, with the last question first, and um, I think many of the other questions sort of intersect a little bit with that. Um, I, think, I think we're still in the process of defining the welfare state as it exists today in, in the current uh, framework, and that's, that's really what um, I've been trying to, uh, pr trying to present some initial thinking around this. Uh, a welfare state that is essentially 
sort of in some ways co it's compensatory because it, it, it actually doesn't embed itself in the labor market at all. It is about compensating for the complete failure of uh, our economic structure uh, or rather our, our, our economic trajectory of building the possibilities uh, of, of a sense of, of full employment and an economic trajectory that will, in, that, that will ensure most participate in the economy. Sorry, I, I put, my, put all the questions into my phone which then yeah, got them. So, um, and, and I also do think that there is this, in the innovation of technology has created a tantalizing new type of opportunity for addressing, uh, thinking about social policy and building policy around it. This is still a process that is unfolding, but it is a fairly distinct project, a distinct project that is different from any other project that I believe we have embarked in, uh, in, in, in India in the past. And I do think that from the point of view of the extent that markers matter, that is a project that accelerated probably around 2015-16 as the Jandhan Aadhaar sort of story uh, scaled up all across the country and DBT in a, uh, in a grand scale actually was possible. Um, I think there is broad political sense consensus around this idea of, co uh, of a sort of labharti enable compensation welfare state uh, because you just have to look at every single political party's manifesto and you have to look across state governments as well as national governments sort of priority welfare programs to see this. It's not that uh, the Indian state is not uh, investing in reforming and uh, uh, also putting uh, 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 prioritizing to some degree critical areas of human development like health, education, and nutrition. You see some very, very important innovation in different parts of the country, but it isn't political priority in the same way. What is given political space and political priority is this sort of combination of compensatory labharti welfare, which also doesn't extract from citizens or from voters uh, what I think the old uh, frameworks of the patronage state that we are used to talking about in the classroom did. This is not so much uh, about um, uh, specific interest groups receiving patronage from the state. This is about a broad-based, quote-unquote, labharti receiving patronage from the state, in return for which loyalty is being extracted. It's also deeply personalized. It's about individual political leaders, not about a moral obligation of a state. So these are the characteristics of the welfare state as we see it today. I do think we had a different experimentation in the 2004 to 14 uh, uh, time, which actually saw its evolution in the, uh, from the 1990s onwards, uh, and perhaps a little bit before that, through the mobilization of social movements that articulated the rights based agenda um, and, and through grassroots mobilization brought it to the national center stage in very close alliance with the judiciary uh, of the time. Much has changed between then and now. The role that the judiciary plays, we, we heard about that in the session before mine, so I needn't say more. Um, and very little uh, active engagement, uh, partly because space for civic, so for social movement mobilization is increasingly harder uh, that today than it was 20 years ago, has created this new kind of welfare regime. So I don't think that any of the, 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 the frameworks that we, that, that we have deployed in the classroom of the past, particularly the evolution of the welfare state in Western countries, would necessarily be uh, useful to understanding this particular moment, because I do think something very different and distinct is happening uh, in India today. It is in some ways the coming together of the Labharti and the Lubhana. It's Lubhana as a palliative uh, for a brief period of time without really being able to address the hard structural questions that we need to be asking ourselves. These are questions of the nature of our economy, questions of redistribution, and question of the type of citizenship that we must aspire to and fight for, none of which find space in our political discourse, and for which political parties 
across political regimes don't seem to have very much time and space for. The tantalizing opportunity of Labharti and Lobhana tends to dominate more than anything else. It is for us to reflect on this and not easily give in to ideas of governance and efficiency uh, if we really want to push the envelope further. Goes back to the question of the compensatory state um, and, 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 and also this question of freebies that comes alongside with it. I personally find the term freebies extremely disconcerting. Despite all the challenges that I have articulated in how the welfare state is unfolding in India today, which we must reflect on, engage with, and ask questions of, I do very firmly believe that it is the moral obligation of all of us as a society to ensure, and particularly elites in this room, to ensure that we push the discourse towards our obligations towards, a, towards our citizenry in the context of the deep-seated social inequality and injustices and lack of dignity that the bulk of Indian citizens have to face on a daily basis. We have to ask ourselves what kind of society we want to build, one that actually invests in all and creates opportunity for all, or one that derides any effort, even limited as it may be, in providing for the poorest as nothing but a freebie, whilst we are perfectly comfortable when we give tax breaks to all those who really ought to be paying their taxes in the guise of economic growth. That's a very fundamental question that we need to be asking ourselves. If we allow ourselves to fall into this trap of the discourse of freebies versus welfare, and how do you define a freebie, and how do you define a, uh, what is welfare? Well, it's your welfare versus mine. What I say today is welfare will be a freebie tomorrow, depending on which part of the political spectrum I sit on. That is not the conversation India should be having, certainly not the conversation we can afford to have given the realities of our economy and our society. On delimitation, it's a big question. Um, it, it's a big question, and I think it's an extremely crucial fault line that India is going to have to confront. Um, I mentioned very much in passing the question of spatial inequality that, our, uh, that, 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 that now dominates uh, the nature of the Indian economy. That spatial economy essentially, uh, stripping it down, is of a economically faster growing southern and western part of, of, of India, uh, but, I, uh, but equally a highly populous uh, and slower growing northern and eastern part of India, which is allowing for degrees of labor, of limited degrees of labor movement and mobility, but raising very important questions about whether the fraternal principle that really binds our federal character together in ways that ensure adequate representation, but also uh, uh, an e a, a more e equitable sharing of taxation so that every citizen of India is guaranteed a minimum public, uh, minimum standard of public services. How will we negotiate and navigate this when the growth pathways uh, uh, diverge so significantly and when as a consequence of delimitation, the nature of representation looks, will look very different? I worry about it also because we do not have the institutional maturity to have developed sites of institutional deliberation in our federal polity that would allow us to navigate this very difficult reality. The Rajya Sabha does not represent states. The Rajya Sabha represents those technocrats who, are, who, want, who need to be in government or in the executive in some form or the other, but cannot, rep, cannot fight elections and many others. The Interstate Council, which could have been a site for some of these negotiations, is moribund and simply they doesn't exist. Uh, the Niti Aayog, which is meant to be the harbinger of cooperative federalism, doesn't quite play that role, in a, at least certainly not on a political front. So where and how will these issues be negotiated and navigated? And can we, in, in, against the backdrop of this extremely centralizing politics, extremely personalized politics, reflections of which we see in the evolution of welfare, of the welfare state, where political legitimacy is being sought through directly building this emotive connect with voters. I was once 
uh, before the Uttar Pradesh election, walking, uh, uh, talking with uh, female voters in parts of eastern Uttar Pradesh. And one of the things I constantly heard was the sort of refrain, Unka photo har jage dikhta hai. And we can see his photo everywhere, the leader's photo in, in, in all the bags of rice and the, the, the pub, through the public distribution system and uh, on our vaccine cards, on our bank cards, on the cards we get, uh, the, the unique ID cards from everywhere. It's, it's not, I mean, it's a, it's a politically smart tool, but the purpose of it really is to build that direct emotive uh, connection. And again, let me say this is not restricted just to uh, the BJP's politics. You see it in every, state, every regional party's form of politics too. So when you have a politics that is so deeply centralized uh, and linked to the emotive connect that a political leader can forge with her voter, how does that contribute into a, a moment in our federal evolution which essentially requires deep deliberation, dialogue, compromise, and essentially uh, decentralization? Where are the institutional sites for this? Where are the political sites for this? And are we as voters and politicians mature enough to manage this deliberation? That's a very crucial fault line that India will have to negotiate. And I think a lot of our future will depend on this. Um, Yamini, we'd like to make one exception. Dhanya Rajendran wants to okay. ask you a question. Last question. Is it audible? My question is, um, in Karnataka and Tamil Nadu, we have seen political parties winning elections with, the prom with one promise that they will give a cash transfer to women. That's a promise made in Telangana also. So do you think that is also part of the compensatory economy? And how long is that model sustainable? So yes, it is, uh, which is not to say that uh, the economic structures are, are designed such that uh, the, there are diff markets discriminate on, in, in, in different ways. It is compensatory because it is not linked back into a larger framework of how you mediate markets in ways that genuinely create equal opportunities for all. It's only doing one part of the project, not the rest. That's where there are multiple factors that contribute to the challenge of low female labor force participation rates in India. Uh, mobility, transportation, economic security, basic safety nets, social protection is one part of that, but there is a lot more. And it's in the, it's the absence of these cash transfers being located in that larger, uh, larger framework that makes me argue that this is in fact compensatory. And therefore, the big fiscal challenge is there's no walking back from this. I don't see how it would be in the incentives of any political party or any policymaker for that matter to in any way roll, roll back from this sort of uh, expansion of, of cash transfers as we have seen it today. Mind you, this is happening at a time when we haven't actually expanded our revenue base at all. So therefore, it is about reprioritization and expenditure switching, not about a significant expansion of the overall investment that we are making into the welfare state per se. So it's, so, so it's in that context uh, that I view all these cash transfers from the perspective of compensation. 